Okay, so we're uh, going to get started now. Just going to, uh, what we're going to do today is we want to just take some time to, re to just think about and just hear what, the, was the, how, hear what was the Lord saying and speaking to Restoration Life through this conference. You know, it's very easy. I mean, you, you realize this. There's so much information that's just, you know, coming out like a fire out of a fire hydrant. And, you know, it's almost impossible to just process all that was said and spoken over these uh, four sessions. And so what we're, we're going to do, I'm going to speak, Dad's going to speak, um, and we're just going to process together what we feel like uh, God was saying to this local church from this conference. And that's, that's going to be what we do today. Um, just before I begin, just want to give you an update. Uh, first of all, on my eye, just really appreciate everyone's prayers and support and just the, just the way you stood in the gap for me. I, I just so appreciate um, everyone at Restoration Life, your support, your prayers, your intercession. It, it means everything to me and um, just really, really do appreciate that. Um, I, you know, we're a small church, so a lot of times news spreads pretty quick. So I, you, you, I don't know if you know or don't know, but on Thursday... We were having our, our forerunner school call with our mentors in Africa, and during the call, um, I started noticing, so I, I have two issues with my eye. One was, one was really, really cloudiness, which really impaired my vision, and the other issue was big amoeba-like floaters, not small floaters, but a bit, big amoeba-like floaters. You can look up amoeba uh, later and if you want to see that, but on the forerunner school call, as we were talking, all of a sudden, I started noticing my, uh, my vision was getting better, and I was kind of like, it just got slowly, slowly better. And then I look at the end of the call, I was like, wow, wait, my vision's better. <laughs> and the cloudiness is not there. And so I was like, oh, my goodness, that just cleared up right during the call. It was amazing. Now, the floaters are still there. The floaters are still there. And so I had a doctor's appointment on Friday. And the doctor confirmed that 90% of the blood from the hemorrhage had cleared up. So that was awesome. So thank you so much for your prayers. Um, really, really, really so much appreciate that. It was a definite trial when, you know, you think, okay, am I going to go blind? You know, I'm a, you know, here I am. I'm going to, like, live the rest of my eye, life out of with just one eye, and like Cyclops, you know with one eye and, you know, it was just kind of depressing and, you know, I couldn't do anything. I just had to like spend two weeks doing nothing. And so thank God for the clearing up of that. The, the doctor does believe these big amoeba light structures are going to go away in uh, several months time. They should go away. If not, he said they could vacuum those out from your eye. That seems kind of weird. So I would prefer natural healing there. So that seems a bit creepy. So <clears throat> I, I so appreciate you guys. I so appreciate your prayers, your support, your love, the way you stood in the gap. And uh, yeah, he, the doctor told us, um, he didn't tell us this when we had the laser procedure, but he told us on Friday, he said, yeah, I don't know how I did that procedure on you that last time because there was so much blood in your eye, I couldn't, I couldn't see where I was doing it. But I'm, I, he said, I did a, basically, I did a heck of a job. And, I'm, and I mean, that's what he said. And I'm like... Yeah, I'm glad you're confident. I'm glad you did. But you also had like 100 people praying and interceding for you. I didn't say that. But I was like, I'm glad you're confident. I'm, I would hate to go if you weren't confident. But anyway, so just really appreciate that. Really, really appreciate everything we did as a church to host this conference. I thought this conference was an outstanding time where I just believe the Lord moved. The Lord, you know, it was opposed greatly. It was definitely the most opposed conference we've ever had spiritually speaking that tells me it's very important for this local church so so i look at that even though i'm the recipient i was the recipient of some of the hardest hits of the warfare i look at that and say okay the good news is god wanted to really say some things and he did which we're going to review that today but i just want to say how much i appreciate us um, everything from, you know, just how our church attended almost every session. I know that's hard with the busy lifestyles we have. Just the hospitality we showed to our guests who came. I mean, you could just feel that it was a, an environment of love and care and appreciation that I know other people when they walked in could feel that. I just really appreciate that. Appreciate Shelly and Jacqueline. Uh, 
uh, just ha um, having that event at their house, inviting some, some people over to eat together, just the worship by the worship team, Drew and Randall, the worship teams, the powerful prophetic worship. I mean, it was, it was the presence of God was here and, uh, um, from the beginning to the end, and, and that's what's most important. It's not about uh, being focused on Terry or Josiah. It's about the Lord and what the Lord was speaking through them, but just having the, the presence of God here was just such a blessing. I so appreciate the worship team. I, I, and also just your, your receptivity to the word of the Lord spoken through Terry and Josiah. Um, just I really felt like it was not hitting any resistance. It was really received well, and I, I appreciate that. And then finally, your generosity. Just that it's such a blessing to be part of a, a, a very generous church and when you give them a love offering, it's not embarrassing. <laughs> you give them a love offering and you're proud, like, okay, this is our church, you know, that, that they're blessed by it. Um, and so thank you for your generosity to bless them. So anyway, just, just love you and appreciate you so much and um, all that you did. So amen. So that's the, the uh, just wanted to say all that before we get going here. But just in this message, what I'm going to do, just wanted to take a break from the normal indwelling life teaching to go through and say, okay, what was the Lord saying to us through this conference? Because you got to realize Terry and Josiah have a pretty big international ministry that goes into all the nations. I don't know if it goes into every nation, but it goes internationally into many nations. And a lot of times they're speaking globally to the body of Christ. But when I'm listening to a message that's spoken here I'm also, I'm listening to first, okay, well, Lord, what are you saying to me personally? I'm saying second, Lord, what are you speaking to the church at large? And then third, I'm asking, okay, Lord, what is it you're saying to restoration life? And now, you know, me being, have that, having the responsibility to lead this church, I'm probably listening for, Lord, what are you saying to this church? Probably more closely than, than most people are just because, okay, Lord, I want to hear I know you're not sending them here just to speak a, a international word, but you're speaking something prophetically to us. I want to discern what you're saying to us in this and through them because they are both prophetic messengers who hear the word of the Lord and hear the voice of the Lord. Lord, what is it the spirit of the Lord is saying to us so that we can hear what you're saying and we can respond and obey? So I, I just want to pluck out from those, those two or four sessions, Lord, what is it that God was speaking? I'm going to share what I sensed and that is uh, as well. So um, the first thing, just, just the first thing that I think just to set the context of where we were corporately um, be, uh, before this conference, I think it's helpful to set the context corporately of where, what the Lord was saying, where we're at corporately is important to know. And we, I go back to the vision that Alice had in uh, this summer, June and July. I'm not sure exactly June, July, sometime in there. But she saw, I'm just going to read the vision she had. We've, we've read it several times, but it's important to hear this. She saw Restoration Life Church as a field with trees of different sizes, some thin and some big. But each tree had its light on, some bright and some blurry. Interesting blurry. I never noticed that until I had my eye issue. <laughs> I, I, just, I just saw that for the first time right just then. Some bright, some blurry. Okay, I think the Lord is speaking there. <laughs> I had no idea until I just read that. Some blurry. That, that, that the vision, the light coming out is blurry. But with the entire light together, it wasn't bright enough to shine through the whole forest as expected. What that means is the, the corporate expression of life and light that's meant to be shining in this church, not individually, it begins individually, but corporately was not bright enough to shine through. You see what I'm saying? This is, God really wants to drill in on the corporate. It's not just the individual. The church is a corporate vessel. This idea of me and Jesus in the prayer closet is unbiblical. Now, I'm glad you have a me and Jesus relationship in the prayer closet. So that adds to the corporate, but the corporate is huge. The local church is huge. God works corporately. 
and individually. Individually is part of the corporate, if that makes sense. So the corporate expression of a local church and what is meant to be corporately coming into the full stature of Jesus Christ is vast, it's huge. Now in America, we are a very independent culture. We are a very independent nation. That culture of independence penetrates into the American church, and so the American church is very independent. And the Lord's trying to drill in on that corporate expression. That is, this, what God is doing at the end of the age is corporate, not just individual. We'll never come into the fullness of Jesus Christ individually and must be corporately. It's only corporately that God does the fullness of what he wants to do. And so, but the individual, the individual, each individual contributes to the corporate expression. Because in this vision Alice had, the light that was meant to be shining corporately was not bright enough because of the failure or the plateauing of the individual lights. You see the connection here? is each individual that has been placed into this local body by Jesus Christ must do their part. We can't, I mean, that's why, that's why, Sunday, that's why Sunday meetings are so vital, you know, and just to see that, you know, a, a number of people are not here today, it's just like, okay, we, we, we were, we're buying into what the culture is, is doing in America, that church is not important. That's not God. That's the spirit of Antichrist rising up to say, you can be individualistic, me and Jesus in the prayer closet. Church doesn't matter. Yet you'll go spend eight hours with your family and you won't come to church. I don't know. That has creeped into the culture in America. It's not acceptable to the Lord. Now I'm preaching to you guys and you're here, so I'm mainly talking to the ones online, hopefully, who listen. I just want to drill this into us that, like Hebrews 10.25 talks about, is not forsaking the assembling together, which is a habit of some. A lot of times people don't come because it's a habit. It's a habit that's been ingrained into them and they haven't broken free out of that habit. I mean, if you would go to a family event, if you would go to work, and that same thing that you overcame to go to work or to go to your family event keeps you from coming to church, you have an issue. Okay? And it's not the Lord. And it's not okay to the Lord. Because we've got to have every individual part in this body working together and committed together to the corporate mission and mandate God's given us. Amen? So she goes through and says, as I, as I thought of how it should have been, I was shown a preview of its, of its expected brightness and beauty. After the preview went off, I pondered what could have been the problem, and I immediately knew that the lesser lights had plateaued. Okay? The lesser lights had plateaued. The, the individuals affecting the corporate hit a plateau, and they didn't know how to pass through, break through their current situation. I pray that God will remove every limitation and the distractions in us individually and bring the spiritual shift needed for the next level according to his wisdom and power. That is the word of the Lord to us. That was the word of the Lord to us from God's perspective before this conference. That was the context in which this conference was, was set, that God was speaking this prophetically, and he sends Terry and Josiah here, I believe, to help spur on and help break. And I, I didn't tell them any, I don't think I told them, I don't believe I told them this. Maybe, I can't remember, I don't think I did. But, to, but I believe God sent them here to help us break through the plateaus, to help each individual break through the plateaus. We got to see the corporate being the, the individual fullness contributing to the corporate makes the corporate come into the fullness. Now, again, if we are slack individually, it affects the corporate. 
If you are lukewarm and apathetic and indifferent individually, that filters into the corporate. Does that make sense? This is so interconnected. Sometimes it would be better if it wasn't so connected, but God's designed us to be this local body that is adding to the corporate of what God wants to do. All right, so the next thing I, I felt like to, to bring up, you with me so far? Okay. The next thing I felt like I needed to share was um, prior to this conference, I had two trusted uh, friends who are, who are prophetic share with me and say, I, I, they felt like my, this, this issue with my eye was a prophetic sign to the church that our vision has been impaired. Now, let me say this. First of all, this was an attack of the devil. I, I'm completely convinced this was not like God and his sovereignty sm uh, smiting me with this impaired vision. This was an attack of the devil. We had tremendous spiritual warfare related to this conference. So I, I'm, I, I totally, totally believe this was an attack of the devil. But the Lord is using it, I believe, as a sign and a wonder to speak to us corporately that our vision has been impaired. Our vision is blurry. Even it confirms exactly what Alice said. Our vision has become blurry. Our vision has become impaired. Um, and so, anyway, I don't, I don't say everything that happens to your body, every single physical thing that happens is always a prophetic sign. I'm, I'm leery. I'm cautious about that. I only want to do it when it's real. When I really get an inward sense of the Lord, this is a prophetic sign. Um, but I do believe this is a prophetic sign. Even the fact that it cleared up during the phone call to the African mentors was a prophetic sign to them that their vision too has been impaired and God wants to clear their vision. Um, I believe that is a prophetic sign. I, I, so anyway, this is what I felt like the Lord was speaking to me personally. Um, and he said, I believe he said this, that you are, that talking to me about my situation, you are a sign and a wonder to Restoration Life Church. And that was quoting from Isaiah chapter 8, verse 18. Many at Restoration Life have had their vision impaired by the attacks of the enemy. Many by the cares of life and the attacks of the devil have blurry impaired vision. And I want to give them eye salve so they might see again. You are, speaking about me, you are a sign and a wonder that many at Restoration Life have had their spiritual vision impaired by the attacks of the devil, by the cares of life, by the pressures of this age, by the desires for other things, and that, that God is going to restore the vision of many at Restoration Life whose spiritual vision has been impaired by the enemy. So I do believe that this situation was God confirmed? I mean, I would prefer not to be a sign and a wonder next time, Lord. Um, it's not too fun, to be honest. <laughs> maybe, so, maybe someone else can, can be that next time. But I, I, I really do believe that this situation was God speaking prophetically to us that the vision of some has become blurry, the vision of some has become impaired, and God wants to break through and heal that vision. And it relates corporately. It relates individually first, corp corporately first, but individually we must come into that which is meant to be expressed corporately because without weakness individually, it affects the corporate. Okay. So what was one of the main things that, that the Lord was speaking through Terry um, and Josiah? What are some of the main things? I believe one of the main things that they were saying is, remember the Remas. I've been listening to Terry forever. Well, not forever, since about 2015, eight years. And I've listened to almost everything he's ever said. Well, not, sorry, I, I've listened to many things he said. Not everything. Several things. A few. Maybe one or two. Okay. But I've never heard him one time ever say, and I'm sure some people in the WhatsApp who listen to it regularly might say, oh, no, we said it on this date and this date and that date. But I, I just, I, I just, uh, I've never heard him say, remember the Ramas, remember the Ramas, remember the Ramas. Maybe someone else has heard him say that. I've never heard him say that. He was quoting out of the Lavender translation from Second Peter. Remember the Ramas. It's the, the now, basically what he's saying, rem remember the now word of God. 
Remember the now word of God. Remember what God has spoken prophetically to you as a body through your history. That's what I believe God... Now, Terry may not have been saying that to, I mean, specifically to us, but I believe the Lord was saying that through him to us. You see what I'm saying? Because that's been a really common theme of what the Lord has been trying to speak to us so often is to this local body, remember the Ramas. Remember what God has spoken through dad. Remember what the Lord has spoken through Noel, who used to come to our church regularly for, for many years, I think 20-something years, almost every year. Remember what Noel has spoken. The Lord has spoken through Noel. Remember what the Lord has spoken through um, Terry, as he's come many times since 2015, and Josiah, and what he's spoken. Remember what the Lord's spoken through me, or Randall, or whoever else has been speaking is we, we've got to pay much closer attention to what the Lord is speaking to us as a body. That's what the Lord was, I believe, saying through Terry here to Restoration Life, is you, Restoration Life, remember the ramas. Remember the ramas. Remember those prophetic words, those prophetic messages God brought specifically for this local church body. Don't forget what God was speaking. Don't forget what God was saying. Does that make sense? And so just, um, you know, it talks about in Hebrews 2.1, it says, for this reason we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard so that we do not drift away from it. Just hear that again. Restoration life, me, you, us, we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard. Why? So that we do not drift away from it. The temptation, the pressure in this day and age that we live in is great to drift away from the word of the Lord. In fact, you will drift away from the word of the Lord if you don't have, ex take extreme measures to remember that which God is spoken. You will drift away from it. And the thing is, you will never know it. You will never know you've drifted away from it. But you're still accountable to the Lord for what you've heard and what I've heard. That's why We've got to, as a church, we've got to, for this reason, we must pay much closer attention to what God has been speaking for our history as a church so we don't drift, so we don't fall away, so we don't fall, be swept away into the culture that's now penetrating into America by the spirit of Antichrist that's leading the church into a great falling away. We must pay much closer attention to what the Lord has spoken through our history. Amen. Hebrews 5.11, concerning him we have much to say and it's hard to explain because you have become dull of hearing. God, help us, help me, help us to break through the dullness of hearing so that we can hear what the Holy Spirit is saying to this church. And, we, and, in, and in hearing what the Holy Spirit is saying to this church, we can obey and heed that word and not be forgetful hearers of what God is speaking, but effectual doers of what he's speaking. Amen? So as I was preparing this message, and I, I, this, this really resonated with me, remember the Ramas, remember the Ramas, remember the Ramas, the Lord just brought to my attention, just reminded me as I was preparing of a message that I preached on July 11th, 2021, about two years ago. And the, the title of the message was Remember, Return, Run. I'm sure everyone here remembers that. In fact, if you do remember it, I might give you a bonus. I'll take you for a cup of coffee or a lunch. But probably none of, no one remembers that. I wouldn't have remembered it. So anyway, but it was, it was amazing to see, okay, that's exactly what Terry was speaking. The Lord is speaking through Terry was what the Lord was trying to say to us two years ago. Remember, 
Remember what God has spoken throughout your history. Remember what God has implanted into the DNA of this church through prophetic messengers uh, for many years. And, and in this message, I just highlighted some key things that God has spoken to us that are vital that we hold on to, that are vital that we hold fast to and bear fruit with, not just a few of us, but every single one of us. Worship and intimacy, vital to this church. A, a throne room ministry, a priestly bride who ministers to the Lord in the Holy of Holies. We are meant to be, and I believe we have really come into that, this Holy of Holies worship that ministers to the Lord as his priestly bride face to face and hears his heart. The, the other thing that God's really just been speaking to us for, for many, for many, many, many years is this call to intimacy with him is this whole thing of the corporate expression of what God wants to do at Restoration Life hinges on our individual intimacy with Him. If we don't have intimacy with the Lord, if we don't have that fresh oil of the Holy Spirit, the corporate will never have that. The corporate will only be the expression of what each individual part is, uh, has and is expressing and is contributing. And so... Worship and intimacy are huge. God's eternal purpose is huge. Remember God's eternal purpose. See, the purpose that God established before time and creation in his eternal counsels, the five things we talked about in that class, that, that Jesus would be the center of, Jesus is the center of everything that God does. And Jesus is to be the center of this church. Jesus is to be the center, the person of Jesus Christ, not just the things of God, but the person of Jesus Christ is to be the center of this church. Our relationship with Jesus Christ, our personal intimacy with Jesus Christ, not just the things of God, but the, the God of all things is meant to be at the center. And you know, you know, the, number two, the father will have a family of Christ-like sons. God is going to have a mature man. God is going to have a mature man. God is going to have a corporate representation. Each local church, based on God's eternal purpose, is meant to be a corporate expression of the fullness of Jesus Christ in a local community called the church, the ecclesia. God is going to have a family of Christ-like sons. He is going to have an equally yoked bride. This bridal message is the heartbeat of this church. Our mission is to make the bride ready in this church, in this community, in this nation, and in the nations. That is our mission. That is what God has, has given us as a mission. That is that mission to be ourselves an equally yoked bride. Number four, the Holy Spirit will have a temple and a house and a body that he fills and expresses himself through. And then number five, Believers have been invited into eternal intimacy, eternal authority, and eternal glory. So that's, that's God's eternal purpose. Other things God's been speaking to us is that we are, we are meant to learn how to live by the indwelling life of Jesus Christ. That's we, why we have taken most of this year in 2023 to go through that slowly to establish that foundation of learning how to live by his life and all that means, and then corporately coming together and learning how to express his life together as a body. He's taught us these things. Remember these things. Don't forget these things. God's voice, hearing God's voice, ministering in power. That's, that's another part of our DNA that's so vital that God's imparted to us over these years is that you can hear the voice of God. We're meant to hear the voice of God. In fact, if you're not hearing the voice of God, you are in trouble for the day and age in which we live. We must hear the Lord's voice in this day and age in which we live. Amen. Noah was only rescued because he heard the voice of God. In the day and age in which we live, hearing the voice of God is no longer charismatic entertainment. Maybe that was what it was 20 years ago, but now in this time in which we live, when the powers of darkness are rising up and evil governments are trying to take form a global government, God must have a prophetic company, a prophetic church that hears the voice of God and follows him. And we've been, you know, dad's been teaching on that for, for decades. <laughs> You know, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the gifts of the Spirit, uh, powerful deliverance ministry, you know, all those things God's taught us throughout our history. The next thing 
we got to remember is that we are an end time forerunner ministry. We are an end time ministry. Okay? We are an end time ministry. We are a forerunner ministry. God has given us a mandate based on Luke 117, a forerunner in the spirit and the power of Elijah to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. That has been our mandate for decades. That is who we are. He has equipped us in that. He's given us understanding of the times in which we live in the, in the end times. The next one, bridal readiness. This is like so, this is so core to our DNA is the Lord is not going to return no matter how dark it gets, the Lord is not going to return until the bride has made herself ready. Revelation 19, 7. So it does not matter how dark it gets. It does not matter how much artificial intelligence takes over the world. It does not matter how corrupt governments get. If the bride is not making herself ready, God, Jesus Christ, is not going to return because he's coming back for a bride who's made herself ready. Therefore, our mandate to be made ready, to make others ready, is vital to helping to shift this age into the kingdom age. Now, so again, and that hinges on us individually, individually making ourselves ready. That's why this is our mission. Our mission is to make the bride ready. A house of prayer for all nations. Vital to our call. Vital to our call, we are becoming a house of prayer for all nations, contending for God's eternal purpose to be fulfilled in the end times, contending for America according to what God originally intended for this nation, contending for Israel's destiny to be fulfilled. So God has trained us to be spiritual warriors to overcome the powers of darkness. This is what, this is what God has been establishing for our history, and the, Lord is, the, the Spirit of the Lord is saying to us, remember the Ramus. Don't forget your DNA. Don't forget you, who you are. Don't forget what God has deposited inside of you. This is not meant to be just Ken and Brian, international ministries, and you attend church. That is not the paradigm of New Testament Christianity. That's American Christianity and has nothing to do with Scripture, where you just go to church as a consumer to hear a message sing some songs, go home, eat the lunch, take a nap, forget what was said. That's not American Christianity. American Christianity, or, or biblical, or that's not biblical Christianity. Biblical Christianity is being a body. Each individual member having the indwelling life of Jesus Christ. Each individual member having the Spirit of God within them. Each one living according to the Spirit. Each one being filled with the Spirit. Each one allowing His life in you to flow out like a river. And then coming together to work together interdependently as one body to be the expression of Jesus Christ connected to the head who is Jesus Christ. Jesus being the head of the ecclesia and that us individually being the expression of what he's speaking to this body. So when we come together on Sunday, this is where we got to get out of our, our American independent mindset. We're not just going to church. You don't go to church. You are the church. You are the church. That's why I'm hitting on the corporate gathering together. That's why people who would miss regularly once or twice a month don't have the New Testament biblical revelation of what church is. We are coming together corporately as the body of Christ to come under the headship of Jesus Christ to hear what Jesus is speaking as the head to his body, this ecclesia, and then going out on, on mission into whatever assignment God has called us to do. That's why Sundays are so important. That's why we cannot, listen, we cannot just like say, I'm just going to casually not come this Sunday or that Sunday. That is just not the Lord. That is your own stinking bad habit. Sorry, I'm not talking to you. I'm talking to those online that skip. <laughs> That's just your bad habit. Sorry, I'm getting a little, maybe it's the Lord, maybe it's me. But seriously, <clears throat> I don't know, 
you know, it, it's surprising to me. We've developed this bad habit at this church where this, it's just it's a habit where a, a portion of us will just skip once or twice every single month, consistently skip, thinking that we can get it online. You cannot get this online. This is not an information download. This is an expression of the corporate body of Jesus Christ. Hebrews 10.25 says, when you forsake the assembling together, that word forsake, I hit on this at the beginning of the year, that word forsake is a strong word that has connotations of being a soldier in, the, in a military who defects from his unit and leaves the army, his army unit at a weaker point against the enemy. When you decide to stay home and watch this online in your pajamas, drinking your coffee, you are making this local body weaker. Okay, so you'll be tempted too to miss, so don't laugh at the people who are not here because you will be tempted. I will be tempted as well, okay? I just want to say this. I'm looking, look, whenever, it was my idea to, it was my idea, I presented to the elders for us not to have church on Labor Day weekend, okay? So I'm looking, okay, whenever there's a time, I believe that it is important to have a times of rest, but not every other Sunday. <laughs> not every other Sunday. Not three times out of a month, not two times out of a month. We need you here. We need every member of the local body functioning together. Amen. All right. Hopefully you love me still. <clears throat> All right. Um, Noah is a prototype of the end time ministry God has given to us. Our ministry is meant to be like Noah. What was Noah? He was a messenger of the Lord. What was Noah? Terry hit on this beautifully. Noah was the lone survivor of the line of Seth, the sons of God. Lo Noah was the lone survivor. That's why God had to bring a flood, because if he didn't bring a flood, the Messiah would not have been able to come because of the mixture that it had infected the line of the sons of God. Sometimes it feels like we're Noah, you know, preaching to like a small group, but it, it doesn't matter. <laughs> Whoever's hearing us, you know, we are a Noah ministry. We are messengers of the Lord. This church is meant to be messengers of the Lord who are hearing what the Lord is saying, what the Lord is speaking. Like Terry was saying, is this age shifted, or, or the age of Noah shifted when the, when the rhema word of God came to Noah. The ages shift when the, when the messengers of God hear the voice of the Lord. And what, what Terry was saying was so true, God is now raising up a corporate John the Baptist throughout the world. And it, they, he, it is God's messengers who are speaking the rhema word of God, and through that proclamation of the word of God by the Spirit of the Lord, however God's doing it, as they speak, the, the age is beginning to shift. We are moving into the kingdom age. At the set, when, the, when the Lord Jesus Christ comes back, Revelation eleven fifteen, 15, the kingdoms of this world will become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he will reign forever and ever. The, the messengers of the Lord are shifting the age by hearing his word and proclaiming it. I mean, it almost sounds laughable. Just, just look at us. We're, we're definitely fulfill 1 Corinthians chapter 1, that God has not chosen many mighty or noble or, or great or wonderful by the eyes of the world. We're basically laughingstock to the world. God's chosen us. The Lord who reigns in heaven, has chosen us, has chosen you, has chosen me, has chosen this ministry, this body, to be that corporate expression, this corporate Noah, who, is a, who are messengers of the Lord, who hear the word of the Lord, and then also who build according to the blueprint shown, which is what Noah did. He heard and he built. 
He heard and he built. It's the prophetic function and the apostolic function. The prophetic functioning and the apostolic functioning based on the word of God, based on the times and seasons in which we live. We are living at the end of the age. God is raising up Noah, separating them from the mixture that is now infiltrating into the church. The church in this nation, the church around the world is a complete mess. God is raising up a remnant. God is setting apart a remnant like Noah to hear the word of the Lord, to proclaim the word of the Lord, to break free of mixture, to break free of all the Babylonian mixture, the worldliness that's, in creepy, that's creeping into and infiltrating the church, to break free of all that so that we might proclaim the word of the Lord to the nations. We might proclaim the word of the Lord, what he's speaking, what he's saying. Jesus Christ is returning. Make yourself ready. That is what this ministry is meant to be. A, a Noah being a prototype. Messengers who hear the word of the Lord. Master builders who build according to the blueprint. Messengers who inquire of God and get revelation. Master builders who implement what God says and base their building on that blueprint. The next thing I just wanted to highlight was prophetic worship. I, I was incredibly thankful for the word that Terry gave to Drew. I just could not agree with that more, that, that Drew has been raised up as a messenger. And I just want us as a church to acknowledge that. He's not just an anointed worship leader. He's not just a gifted worship leader. He's both, and he's also incredibly faithful, but just that God has really raised him up as a messenger of the Lord. I, I mean, I, I don't, I mean, just so many Sundays, I'm just like, okay, that's the word of the Lord to us. That's the word of the Lord to us. And we need to honor that, that, that. We need to honor that what God has raised up in us, it's a, it's a blessing. It's a huge blessing. It's, it's so, um, the prophetic is so strong on Drew. And, and just want to just say, just acknowledge it, honor it. And therefore, let's be ready at 10 a.m. in the sanctuary to show honor to what God's doing through Drew and the worship, other worship teams. All right? Amen. Amen. I don't think many people were late. Uh, okay, listen. I'm not, I'm not going to talk about this Sunday. I'm just going to talk about in the past, okay, not this Sunday, okay? So I'm not talking about this Sunday. I don't even know who. All I know this Sunday was when I walked up and we started, like two people were in the room, maybe three, maybe five. I'm like, come on. We just had this, like, awesome conference. We just build off the momentum, <laughs> I, 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 listen, you ask the Lord about this, all right? So ask the Lord about this. I think it's important to be here on time. I really think it's important. Um, I, I, you know, I addressed this back at the beginning of the year, and then I remember Ben came and, and spoke the next week. And it, well, I mean, we had the whole place filled with everybody. Everybody, everybody came, and everybody was on time, and Ben was like, whoa. Wow, that's, that's odd. I mean, it's a habit that's, that's throughout the world, uh, world. This thing where we, I mean, we would never go to work late. I don't think. Maybe you would. I, I mean, it's like you would get fired if you did it too much. I don't know. But, you know, it's like where it, did we develop this habit that it's okay to the Lord when we're gathering together to worship him to consistently be 15, 20, 30 minutes late? I don't know. I think it's something we need to correct. I think it is something. We need to be here at 10 a.m. I would prefer if you're here at 945 just so you're ready. But if just, hey, look, if you can't get here at 945, get here at 10. Even if it's 10 on 1, I'll be okay with that. Just, it, it's important. It's important that we're honoring God and we're hearing the Lord and what the Lord's speaking to us prophetically, corporately uh, in our worship times. Our worship has been great. Our worship has been great. And, and, and it's just so important that we show honor and we're not complacent or indifferent to that. Amen. Okay. So remember what Terry said. Don't be offended at me. That was the word of the Lord. Don't be offended at me. Okay. Let's just, I'll just say this. I have not said one thing corrective 
in probably since January, okay? So I'm due one corrective message every so often. I, I keep track of that because I, I think it's important. I heard Mike Bickle say that for, do you need to speak 10 words of encouragement for every word of correction? And I, I think that's, that's so wise. And I try to follow that a lot of times. And so I have not, I don't think I've, you might correct me, but I don't think I've, I've, I've brought one corrective word since January. And this is, this is a corrective word to us. God, but I, it's, I believe it's what God's speaking. You test it and you judge it. Amen. So corporate alignment to the mission. That's really what Josiah was, I believe the Lord was speaking to us through Josiah. Revelation 22, 17, the spirit and the bride say, come. That's really the mandate of this church is our mission is to make the bride of Christ ready. In this church, in this community, in this nation, and in the nations, our mandate is to make the bride of Christ ready. Well, how does that happen? It happens by corporate alignment to this mission that, first of all, individually, we're coming into oneness with the Spirit. Hear, hear me on this, is we cannot just, listen, Individually, each person at Restoration Life, each person that God has placed in this body, from the youngest to the oldest, are intended to come into oneness with the Holy Spirit. Now, we are one with him, spirit to spirit, but that's meant to be a oneness, a fullness of oneness with him. That's the first thing. We cannot come into corporate alignment with this Revelation 22, 17, bridal cry without oneness of the Spirit individually. And then number two, oneness as it relates to our mission. See, the bride is saying come. Why is the bride saying come? She's a corporate bride. It's not one individual crying out in a cave somewhere, Lord, come. It's a corporate people. Corporate people who have said, we want you to come. We are your bride. We have made ourselves ready. Lord, we want you to come. It's coming into alignment corporately with the mission. And then the next one, I just put here, corporately, all of us coming into this together into this one as a mature man who represents Christ. See, this is where, and they hit on this many times, many, they, said it, they said it quite often, independence, independence is the greatest barrier to corporate alignment. Independence. I can just have my relationship with God in the prayer closet or I don't need to be here this Sunday I, don't, I, can, I can come once a, once a month, it's okay. That independent spirit it, it is not the Lord. If we're going to come into this fulfillment of our mission to be a bride made ready, to make a bride ready, that independence that we all have, all of us, I struggle with it, all, you struggle with it, all of us struggle with it, the cross must work in us to crucify that independence so that we become interdependent. We're dependent on the Lord and we're, we're interdependent on one another. May God deliver us of interdependence. Okay, now, now to the correction. Just kidding. <laughs> I think this one is probably the biggest one for us. Familiarity. That's a big one for us. It's a big one for me, all right? Familiarity, I, I completely get it, okay? I completely get it. It's easy when you've been together with, with people for so long to become familiar. I, I totally get it. So it is, a, it is something we are going to have to battle against forever. I don't think it's something you can ever totally not have to be, be aware of and guard against, but we must guard against it and we must overcome it corporately 
so that we can fulfill the mission. I, I'm, just, I'm concerned more that we fulfill the mission God's given to us. And I know familiarity is a big thing that would hinder us becoming familiar. Familiar with the leadership, familiar with the messaging, familiar with what we do on Sunday, familiar with the people around us, familiar, familiar, familiar. And so, you know, I, I, I base this on what Terry said. He said, uh, some of you have known Brian since he was a little squirt, just a twig. Um, probably none of you knew me when I was a squirt or a twig, you know, because I've always been fairly tall. Uh, but what he was getting at was being familiar. Familiar. Now, it, it, it's not just about me. It's just familiar with whoever. It, 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 it would be... When we, we battled familiarity when dad was leading. In fact, I'm going to share an example of that in a minute because I, went, had, I referenced another message I preached from 2011 directly hitting this when dad was still the pastor that is something we, we have, uh, we, we're fighting against. Familiarity breeds contempt. And so we've got to fight familiarity to become what God wants us to be. See, your perception determines your reception. Your perception determines your reception. How you perceive someone determines how you receive from someone. When Terry and Josiah come, most of us perceive them as the messengers they are. Therefore, we receive them as prophets, and we receive a prophet's reward. Your perception determines your reception. So how you perceive someone determines how you receive from someone, and how you receive from someone determines the fruit that's produced by the word they share. So Jesus had this issue. If Jesus had this issue... I'm sure everyone's going to have this issue. This is a familiar thing that every single one of us has to battle against and overcome. Jesus could not do many miracles in his own hometown. And he says, a prophet is not without honor except in his own home. And he's saying that, that basically the people of, of Nazareth looked at Jesus and said, oh, that's Mary's son. Oh, that's Joseph's son. Oh, that's the carpenter. Oh, that's the brother of James. Or, you know, that this... This, they did not perceive him as the Messiah. They did not perceive him as God, the eternal son, who created the universe with his mere words, incarnated in human flesh, standing before them. And because they did not perceive him as who he was, they did not receive him. And that limited the God of Genesis 1 from doing miracles in their midst. Your perception determines your reception. Here's what I shared. I want to share this. I preached a message on September 24th, 2011. And I was dealing with this very same issue. And I, and I don't, you know, listen, we're going to probably be dealing, we're going to probably have to address this repeatedly because it's just a common thing we have to fight through. But this is what I told our church on, on September 24th, 2011. 12 years ago. So I was 39, just two years older than John is right now. That's a long time ago. Here's what I said. I said, let me break it down this way. My brothers and I perceive our pastor as dad. Our wives perceive our pastor as father-in-law. Our children perceive him as G-daddy. Others perceive him as their former pastor at the Baptist church, their friend, or the man who teaches every Sunday. The point is we all have a perception of our pastor that determines the depth to which we receive him and how he, he can have a word directly from heaven and we may only receive it to a small de degree because we, like the people of Nazareth, say, is this not Ken, my dad? Is this not Ken, my father-in-law? Is this not Ken, my friend? See, perception determines reception. Amen? See, we can easily, we can easily become familiar. Here, here's just some examples. We can easily become familiar with the leadership. 
Angie and I, mom and dad, Randall and Therese, the, the pastors that are leading our small groups, we, all of us, we can easily become familiar with the leadership and the result is we can't hear what the Lord is saying to them and through them. Oh, that's just Brian upset because we didn't get here at 10 o'clock. <laughs> I'm kidding. We can become familiar with the message and the result is we easily tune out to the call to inward transformation and change. How, how, how easy this is. We've heard the messaging. We've heard the message for however many years, and we can create a filter through which we filter out what God is speaking. We filter out what God's saying through the messaging we've heard because we're familiar with it, and we can stay the same without change. The worship. And the result is we show up to church consistently 15 to 30 minutes late. Sunday services. And the result is we only attend church once or twice a month. Making ourselves ready. And the result is we don't plant the truth of what we are studying in house church deep in our hearts. I just want to, I'm just challenging us here. I'm not trying to bring us under condemnation. I'm just challenging us for the sake of the mission, for the sake of the mission God's given to us. I want us to be jealous for the mission God's given to us corporately. Amen? So as I was preparing, as I was preparing this message, the Lord directed me to some notes that Noel was speaking to us corporately, was speaking to our church on October the 10th, 2011. Again, I don't know why, we're going back all the way to 2011, several times as a message. And I was just looking over those and I was like, oh man. Now, I, I don't believe we are where we were at in 2011, all right? I believe God has moved us on much further. Thank God. But I still believe some, some, I'm going back to Alice's vision, there were some who's, who were blurry, some are in that condition that a lot of us were in in 2011. So, so for that sake of that portion, I'm going to say these things. I want you to hear what God was speaking through Noel 12 years ago. Talking about, I'm going to break it down. First of all, talk about our mandate. As it relates to our mandate, our corporate mandate, he said, you have a mandate all of you, now get that, all of you, every individual member, all of you have a mandate to see a bride made ready. See, he was hitting on, this is not just Ken and Brian. This is not just Ken and Brian. All of us, all of us have a mandate to, to see a bride made ready. We all have to get more focused on our mandate. We've got to get more focused on our mandate. We all need to take responsibility and accountability for our mandate. Again, this is all of us. This is not about just coming to church on Sunday. This is about fulfilling the mission to make the bride ready, to be ready, to make the bride ready. All of us need to take responsibility and accountability for our mandate. This vision has to own our lives. This vision, not my vision, not dad's vision, the Lord's vision to have a bride made ready must own our lives. Not just, this, this is again, Noel hit, was hitting on this 12 years ago, not just the leadership, but all of us. From the youngest to the oldest, no one is exempt. All of us, all of us, not just the leadership, all of us. Listen to this. This is what Noel said, is we will all have the same accountability before God. We will be held accountable before God. We must make a wholehearted choice to embrace this vision fully. Amen. Let's do it. Amen. Here's what he said. Okay, again, 
take me out of the picture. This is what Noel said. This is what, I want us to hear what the Lord was speaking through Noel. We can't steward this vision and calling unless we are wholehearted. That's what Terry was hitting on. God will strongly support those whose hearts are wholly his. Wholeheartedness is the way we steward this vision. Every one of us needs to take up this mantle, the mantle, hey, listen, every one of us needs to take up the mantle of this ministry so that we can inherit a legacy. What he means is the, the legacy that was imparted through Noel to dad, that Nad, dad imparted to us over many, many years. Every one of us is to take up the mantle of this ministry so we can inherit a legacy. The time is now. We are accountable for our calling. Strength is in the cluster. That's why the corporate is so important. That's why if one individual slumbers and slips and is put out of place, it affects the corporate. There, there is strength in the cluster. We are a Zion in the spirit, meaning that we are meant to be a holy of holies uh, church. A, a church where the holy of holies dwells in fullness. Next, he went on and talked about the Elijah army. He's saying to us, this is, God is building an Elijah army throughout the earth, and God is calling each one of us, and then together corporately, to be part of this Elijah army. Noel was saying, Noel was saying, we are called to be part of an Elijah army that Jesus is raising up in these end times. Amen. I want to be part of this Elijah army. I want to be part of this. I hope you do too. We want to be part of this Elijah army, this army that is anointed with the spirit and the power of Elijah, this army that is anointed with the prophetic spirit of God to be that army that prepares the way of the Lord. Our nation desperately needs it. He said that 12 years ago. How much more? We can't even figure out what bathroom to use. How much more does our nation need an Elijah army and this cultural upheaval through which we are experiencing when insanity is becoming normalized? How much more do we need an Elijah army to confront and to call out the darkness and the perversion that's creeping into this culture and even into the church? We need an Elijah army. We must become this Elijah army. The time is now. It was now 12 years ago. How much more now? We can't be in an army if we are out of rank or drifting. Oh, hear that. Again, this is what Noel said, not me. We cannot be in this army if we are out of rank, we're not in divine order. We cannot be part of this army if we are out of rank or we are drifting. Impaired vision. We cannot be a part of this army if we are out of rank or drifting. Lukewarm, indifferent, complacent. We, we must become this Elijah army. Amen. This is what he said again. God wants to put us out there as an Elijah to our community and nation. He has placed upon us the mantle of Elijah. Receive that. It's not... The spirit, of, the spirit of Elijah is not the... It, it, the spirit of Elijah is the Holy Spirit and the way he anointed Elijah as a prophetic messenger to confront the darkness of his time and to make a nation ready and to call a nation to repentance. That spirit of Elijah, the Holy Spirit, is on this ministry. We have an anointing of the Holy Spirit. The spirit of Elijah... That spirit of Elijah is meant to call out to the church a message of repentance to turn back to God and be the people God wants us to be. 
I would encourage you just to get these notes or be on the YouTube channel and, and to read through what Noel spoke and just really pray through these things. This is, isn't this so relevant right now? I mean, he's a true forerunner. He is so relevant. What he was speaking 12 years ago, so relevant for right now. Here's was his warning against indifference and familiarity. We are unique and different. That's what Terry was hitting on. Be distinct. Don't be mixed up with the line of Cain. Be distinct. Be different. That's what he was saying to us as a church. We just need to understand, we're, you probably do, we are not your typical community church. We're an end-time forerunner ministry anointed with the spirit and the power of Elijah. That's why sometimes people come here and they can't make it even through the worship. Sometimes I feel encouraged by that because I'm like, well, at least I know Drew's a good worship leader, so at least they didn't leave when I was preaching. That's happened too. But we are different. We are unique. God's DNA is upon us to be an end-time forerunner ministry. Here's what he was saying then. If you continue to be indifferent to your calling... And I, don't, and I believe to a large degree, okay, I just want to say this. I believe to a large degree we have broken through a lot of the indifference, but there's still some, some remnants of that remaining. If you continue to be indifferent to your, to your calling, you will forfeit your remnant status. God help us. Here's what Noel said. Familiarity, familiarity, breeds contempt. When you become familiar with leadership or you become familiar with the message and you become familiar with church and you become familiar with the lingo and the, and the language and all that stuff, it can actually begin to breed contempt where it's almost like, you know, fingernails on a chalkboard. Here's what Noel said. Whatever is different and unique, we need to desire for ourselves. We need to have a sense of our own uniqueness and difference. I thank God for the way he's made us. I thank God we're not a, a cookie-cutter church that is like every other church out there. That we have a unique mission and mandate from the Lord to be a forerunner ministry in the spirit and power of Elijah to make ready the bride of Christ in the end times. We will forfeit our high prestige as a, as a foreign ministry if we remain indifferent. We are so honored and privileged. Just, just let that sink into us for a second. We are so honored and privileged. Not be, of course, it's not because of anything. Just look at us. <laughs> We're the weak and the despised that God's chosen. So, but we are honored and privilege in the sight of God to have this calling and this anointing that he's deposited in us for many, many years. And I don't know if you guys, some of you will remember, a lot of you won't because you weren't here, but Noel went into just intense weeping. I don't even know. It was, it was, I just remember, I was, what, 39? I just remember just going, okay, this is a little weird. This is a little, you know, I'm not, I mean, just being honest, like, okay, this is a little awkward. You know, not, not knowing really, I'm just being honest, not knowing what burden was gripping him because he was weeping before he shared what it was. And I'm like, oh, God, we're about to get a spanking. I'm like, oh, no, I, I'm wrong. I'm, and I, you know, you felt that way a lot when Noel was preaching. Okay, I, you, I'm wrong, I'm wrong, I'm wrong. Okay, I did it. But I remember him weeping and just like this just overwhelming burden came on upon him. And, and what he was weeping for was, was this. He said, now, again, this is back then, and I'm not putting back then on us now, but I'm saying there's probably still some residue of this in some and, and, and more so in others. There is, so, there is so little evidence that we care too much about our calling. This is a season and time when if there is no response to all that God has done, then we will forfeit our calling. Now, again, I, I, don't, I, I thank God we repented. I thank God that we are not indifferent like we were because I, I do believe that was at stake back then. But there's no reason why we can't be challenged with the same thing in the future. We've got to overcome that indifference. Amen? 
We cannot be, or let me say this, if we have a lack of response, commitment and care, God virtually turns his back and we don't even know it. If we don't care, God will walk out the door and we won't even know it. He will be on the outside of the door and we will be on our own we will be on our own ministry treadmill trying to make things happen in our own strength and power. All kingdom fruitfulness will be out the window. Again, thank God we're not there. Thank God we're not there. But I do believe God wants to speak to some. God wants to challenge some who have fallen into that indifference, who have fallen into that place of complacency. We cannot be indifferent to our calling. Our spiritual life must influence our natural life. This is huge. Our spiritual life must influence our natural life, not the other way around. Not the other way around. Noah was weeping because he didn't know if what he said would make any difference. And he hit on this. Ears to hear what the Spirit is saying. Do our ears need a spiritual circumcision? Familiarity breeds contempt. This is what he said. We are not hearing what the Spirit is saying to the church. Now, again, we are doing significantly better now. All right, but we've got to always be careful that we don't grow dull in our hearing. Because if we grow dull in our hearing, our vision will be impaired. Our vision will be impaired. If we grow dull in our hearing, what is the Spirit saying to the church? And he addressed this to us, to each one of us, and I would address it to each one of us. Are we numbered in the final gathering of the Jew and Gentile bride? We have so little time. We have so little time. And I believe one of the scripture verses the Lord has given us about Noel is, is from Abel, Hebrews chapter 11, that even though Abel is dead, he still speaks. Even though Noel is dead, he still speaks. His, because he was a true messenger of the Lord, his voice still resonates. Are we numbered in the final in gathering of the Jew and Gentile bride? We have so little time. How can we, this is what he, another thing he said, how can we call people to be married to him if we are not married to him? It's all related to intimacy. Everything I'm talking about today, every single thing I'm talking about today, boils down to one thing, first love, intimacy. In the secret place relationship with the Lord, that secret place of knowing him. Consider your spiritual life more than your natural life. You are a warrior bride. You are a warrior bride. We are a warring bride. Now, I want, to, I want to end this little segment here by the encouragement here of what God wants to do. So here's a, here's a dynamic of a message that's, that can be challenging here is you might have 40% who are just completely on track with where we're going, and that 40% has a sensitive conscience. And so that 40% starts going, oh, no, I'm doing wrong. And, you know, it's like maybe there's one little thing small that needs to be corrected, but you get into condemnation. But the one who, the, the other percentage that are not really on board with what God's saying, they're kind of like, you know, that's not really for me, and they, they miss it. So just just listen, just this is God speaking. Wherever it is, you feel like 
the Lord wants to bring some correction to you. Just receive it. Just receive it where he wants to correct us. Because God is jealous over us to fulfill this mission and mandate he's given us. Now, th this is where Noel was speaking prophetically to us. I want us to hear this. Is that we are called to this nation. We are to have an impact on this nation. <clears throat> we are called beyond the four walls, all of us. God wants to exalt this ministry. God wants to exalt this ministry. Now, that doesn't mean we're going to be on the cover of Charisma magazine or anything like that. <laughs> but God wants to exalt this ministry, to give this ministry more influence, more impact in this community, nation, in the nations. And this, here's what he said. But we have become too familiar with our pastor, speaking about that when we were speaking it, but it would, I would just say we've become too familiar with the leadership team and we need to make a decision. We're going to follow this Elijah, this leadership team so that we can have a double portion corporately of the spirit and the power of Elijah. He gave us Luke 2.32 that we are called corporately to be a light of revelation to the Gentiles. God has called us to the nations. God has called us as messengers to this nation. He said to us, we shall be great in the sight of the Lord like John the Baptist was great. How incredible is that? I want that. I don't want that just for one or two or five or ten. I want that for this entire body. I want God to look down on this entire body. And I believe he does to a large degree. So hear what I'm saying. I'm not... It's just, it's just a small portion. God wants to challenge to go further and deeper. I, kn I know God is wanting to challenge some here to go, small, uh, to, go, to go deeper in this, to go more into this. I know a lot of already are doing this. I understand that. I understand that. But I want God to look upon this entire church, restoration life, as one corporate body, and God to say... Like he said to Noel, we shall be great in the sight of the Lord as a corporate John the Baptist. And that we need, we must accept Luke 117 as our calling. That's who we are. It is time for us to be revealed as a corporate Elijah to our nation. It is time for us to come out of the wilderness. Amen. Amen. So dad is going to come and share some things. All right, let's say, let's say amen. Amen. Enthusiastic amen. 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 All right. Uh, yeah, I won't take, uh, try not to take too long, but I do want to share uh, just a few things that I was sensing. Uh, a lot of it goes along with what Brian uh, was saying. Um, but I do want to just kind of hit on a few things. I came up with about five things that I believe God accomplished uh, and just what he accomplished during the conference and then a few things about what uh, I sense he was saying to us. Um, and so in terms of uh, what he accomplished, uh, I believe what happened this weekend was that he uh, secured... Uh, our call as forerunners. There was, a, I really believe there was a, something accomplished in the spirit where he uh, secured that call among us. And of course, Brian talked a lot about uh, all of that uh, so that he secured it so that we now, I believe, there's a corporate understanding, a corporate vision, a co corporate acceptance of us as a whole entire fellowship of, of, of that forerunner call. And I do there are a couple of things I want to explain. Um, there was a sense I had over the weekend, last weekend, that this would pertain really to a lot of the newer people uh, in our midst, um, that just sense that this call as a vessel just like happened last weekend or just uh, in the last uh, few maybe months or something like that. It was just a recent thing that we were a community church uh, and that we now got this vision of being a forerunner vessel. Uh, and I just want to just to hit that because 
not so much, it's not a correction so much, it's just an explanation, really, for those who uh, maybe have been, not been with us for a long period of time. And, but, you know, we really received this call as forerunners back in uh, 1996, even actually before that. Um, it was interesting, Brian was talking about that we're not a community church, that we're a forerunner ministry. Uh, and, you know, one of the first prophetic words we received, it was probably the second one that we received as a, as a church when back in the early 90s, 19, uh, I'm not sure exactly the time, was that uh, we received a word that we had a choice whether to be a community church or a, or it wasn't, the, you didn't use the word forerunner, but we had a choice to be a community church or to go on and on the journey that the Lord really wanted us to do. Uh, and he had, he, and I, I said to the person who, if somebody outside the church, I said to him, how would we know? And he said, you'll know. And uh, this kind of become a funny story uh, now, but the very next Sunday, uh, we had uh, a, a man who gave a tongues message uh, and the, the lady who was the associate pastor's wife at the time was a keyboard player on our worship team and she gave the interpretation, worship me in spirit uh, and in truth. Uh, and so, you know, at the time we were uh, still a Baptist church and, uh, you know, it's probably easier to have the devil show up in your church service than have a tongues message if you're a Baptist church. And so um, the phone rang off the hook for the whole week after that. And anyway, I won't go into all the details, but at that point in time, I, we had to say yes to we're not going to be a community church. We're going to go on with what God had for us. Now, we had no idea about the bride. We had no idea about the forerunner call. But that began the journey. And then in 96 and 97, uh, the Lord began to really solidify the, uh, the understanding of us as a forerunner ministry. Uh, it, he used Noel, uh, and I think it was really sealed in 97. The Lord uh, spoke to Donna and I don't, did Brian, I don't think Brian actually went to that conference, but the Lord told us we had to go to Kansas City to the Passion for Jesus conference that Mike Bickle was doing at that point in time. And so we did. Uh, and that was where he gave a real, Mike Bickle gave a real powerfully anointed call to forerunners. And we said yes to that. And that kind of began the uh, the journey along with Noah. And so the Lord sent Noah for a number of years to kind of solidify that call as forerunners. Uh, and then he connected us, after that, connected us with Terry to take us to a, a deeper, even a deeper level of understanding all that. So uh, we had that call progressively being explained to us. And of course, he began to give us revelation of the bride, revelation of the spirit of power of Elijah, of a variety of issues related to that. And he began to send us out as forerunners probably in the late 1990s. And the first place where I believe that we went as a forerunner was to Fiji. We went to Fiji and, uh, you know, nothing ever came of that really, but we, were, we began to speak uh, the, uh, the message of the bride uh, and the... the, the the glorious church and to be made ready. And then he began to send us to India and we went to India as forerunners and uh, the, the Lord began to, uh, would use us to speak on uh, the bride. I, I remember the, I think it was the first time we went, Donna and I went and um, I had a message on Matthew 25 uh, about the, the parable of the 10 virgins and we thought, it didn't, uh, you know, it was like, oh man, they did not receive this. This is not going to work out. They're going to kick us out of here. Uh, you know, it just kind of felt that way. But we, we went back several times, and we, but we went as forerunners. Uh, and then, of course, the, the ministry in Africa uh, that we did. Uh, and so that's, of course, still going on. So the, the point I'm trying to make is that you know, when this weekend didn't just like, oh, we're called this a vessel. Uh, we've, we've known that for a long period of time, although 
the Lord really accomplished a lot, I believe, this weekend of securing that understanding of us as a forerunner vessel. And, and not even just understanding, but acceptance of it and a breakthrough in the spirit realm over that. I really believe that happened. I really believe also that the Lord's going to now begin to raise up some of the young ones in our midst. Uh, uh, and when I say young ones, you know, 40s and young, I mean, they're 40 something's pretty young to me, but, uh, and Larry too, uh, yeah. But, um, it, 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 with a great understanding and participation in that. Okay, so that's, I'm still talking about securing our call as forerunners. I don't, and uh, 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 Evan, uh, Ben, whoever's up there, uh, put that little chart up there. I want to, I want to make sure we understand this because. Uh, you know, we view, Terry used the, the concept of messengers and he used the concept of vessel uh, a lot in the weekend. And so uh, if you see that little chart, you got that first block with it says forerunners, spirit and power of Elijah, friends of, bride, of the bridegroom, Zacharias's, uh, and I, I added, uh, I should have put it in there, vessel. That's basically saying the same thing. Uh, forerunners is an overriding sense of the call. Spirit and power of Elijah is the empowerment of that. Friends of the bridegroom is that call in the context of preparing the bride. Uh, vessel would be another way of saying that same thing, just a different terminology, but the, the same issue. Uh, Zacharias, as I put that in there, in, the, in 2019, the Lord told us to, I want you to birth John the Baptist. In other words, birth forerunners. Uh, and so the forerunner school kind of started out of that. The work with the, the life school mentors, the African mentors, started as a result of that. Uh, so that's all the same thing. So a vessel is not different than a forerunner. It's, the same, it's just a different terminology that describes the overall call that we've had. Now, if you look at the three blocks below that, messengers, master builders, and golden altar intercessors, those are three specific functions uh, that, that come out of that overall call. Uh, so in other words, uh, I, I like to use uh, the Apostle Paul and the way he, he ministered in the nations as an example of that. When he went on his missionary journeys, he first went as a messenger. So what he did, he would go like he would go to the synagogues where the people were gathered. He would go there to, to where they were gathered, uh, and he would call them to a new thing. Uh, you know, he was saying, Jesus is the Messiah. Come into this wineskin of accepting him as the Messiah. And for those who said yes to that, and not everybody did, but if you, for those who said yes, then he would function as a master builder. So like you see his, in this in his letters and the fact that in certain places he spent months, even years, what was he doing? He was building the their, their spiritual environment for them to function and to receive Christ as the Messiah. Uh, and so that's the way we function in this forerunner call. We go as messengers, which is the message. We give the voice. We say, uh, you know, the, the Lord is coming back. Make yourself ready as a bride. Then for those who receive that, uh, we try to help them create a wineskin uh, for our, our spiritual environment for, them, for that to be captured into their heart, for that to come forth. And, uh, we, you know, we see that really clearly with what we're doing in Africa. Uh, you know, we, we are, we first go as a messenger and for those that say yes to it, we try to help them, uh, to create an environment that the bride can be made ready for, for a lot. Most of the church, there's not even a spiritual environment. A lot of the church there's not even a spiritual environment for the bride to be made ready. So, and then intercessors are those who pray golden altar prayers to, to see Christ for Christ to be formed in a people. But those three blocks fit into that messengerial, that vessel, that spirit, that forerunner call 
uh, to do that. So I wanted to clarify that so we make sure we, we're, we understand uh, the terminology. So that's the secure our call as forerunners. The second thing, uh, and Brian talked about this, he, I believe on, on this weekend he reignited our journey of readiness and the function of being the vessel, uh, kind of from the plateau uh, issue. Uh, the third point, I believe that this weekend secured Brian as the leader of the church. Um, and he talked a lot about that, so I won't elaborate on it. But I think it's really, really important that, and this probably is more to, like he said, those that have been with, with us for a long period of time. We need to view him as the leader of this, of this church. We need to view him as the messenger builder that he truly is. Uh, you know, we can't view him as Joseph's son. Uh, we have to view him and, and the call uh, as the way the Lord sees it. And it, we ta he talked a good bit about that. And so uh, the fourth thing, I believe he secured Drew as a forerunner, uh, as a real messenger, uh, you know, and, and that was a real uh, securing in the eyes of the people and uh, uh, all of that. So uh, anyway, those are the four things that I believe that God accomplished. <clears throat> I want to share th also quickly three things I believe God spoke. Um, uh, and Brian hit uh, some on all of this. Uh, we must, we mu first one, one thing is that we must go free from an independent spirit. Uh, he, Terry hit on that independent spirit. Uh, and you know, it's not just independent spirit in terms of coming to church and that type of of thing, the, the independent spirit is: Will I obey God, or will I not? You know, we're all faced with different things, different uh, issues that God puts before us. An independent spirit says, "Well, it comes to our will. Maybe I'll obey. Maybe I won't." Uh, you know, and there's some things are just simple things. Other things are extremely challenging things. Uh, you know, like the, for right now, right before us is God, we believe God has called us to go back to Africa in, in early next year. And just to be honest, there's nothing in my flesh that wants to go back to Africa. If I could get translated there and minister in the conference and translated back, I would be excited about it. But unfortunately, there's not that. There's uh, just a lot of issues that go along with that. Uh, so, you know, we've got to, first we've got to find out what God's saying, but then we've got to, if he says go, we've got to go. We can't take an independent spirit and say, ah, I'm, I don't think I want to go. You know, is, is he saying yes? If he is, we have to do it. And so, but that's that we all are faced with a myriad of those kind of decisions throughout our life. And he's, you know, the, the independent spirit has to go uh, from us. That, I think he's, that's one thing that Lord was speaking. Uh, the second thing, uh, this is the, well, what Brian said about the Remas, I think is right. I had not, I had not uh, understood that, but well, he did a great job of explaining that. But I think another aspect of the Remas that Terry was speaking was this, uh, that, we are at the end of the age. In other words, I think what he was saying it without actually saying it is that, you know, he's had encounters from the Lord uh, that the seals have been broken, or not all of them, but that the first two seals have been broken. The first seal of the spirit of Antichrist being released and the second seal of taking peace from the earth. And we've, we see that. Uh, happening in the earth and what he's saying, because he was talking about, you know, not everybody encounters Gabriel. Gabriel doesn't come to visit everybody. But what the church has to do is evaluate it, obviously, but if it, we believe this is, that he's really, Gabriel's really encountered him and these words are right, those are the remus. And that's what activates, going to First and Second Peter, that's what activates uh, 
the coming of the Lord, not a theological study of eschatology. Uh, you know, I've got a two-volume commentary on the book of Revelation. It's probably well over a 1,000 pages. That doesn't activate the second coming, but the rema of the Lord. This is what he was saying, I believe, is the rema of the Lord is what activates the second coming and the need to get ready. And I believe what he was saying in this conference is that the rema has come and that we're, in, that we're in this season of the second coming. Ready or not, here it comes, and that we have a call to, to be made ready uh, for that. So we must get ready, and we must focus on being the vessel that we are called uh, to be. Uh, and the third thing, uh, I, uh, and of course there's a lot of other things that he said, but the third thing that I want to share, and this will be the last thing, is that Babylon is here, and we must come out of it. Amen. Babylon is here. Uh, uh, so it's not coming. We're Babel, the, the mystery Babylon of Revelation 17 and 18, I don't think it's fully formed yet, but it's forming before our very eyes. Uh, and this was really encouraging to me because, uh, you know, we were trying to decide what, what all we need to prepare for for our forerunner ministry and some of the classes we need to develop. And I can't, and even though I don't, at this point, don't plan on teaching this as a class, forerunner school class or whatever, the Lord really has been putting it on my heart ever since the summer or even maybe before uh, that I need to do a teaching series on Mystery Babylon the Great and the need to live as Daniel uh, in the midst of Babylon. Uh, and so I've been working on it and I've got about three, I've got three sessions finished and I've got a fourth that I be close to being through and I'll probably have or maybe six sessions altogether or seven uh, and when he said that it came to me okay this is really the word of the Lord because Babylon is uh, is on the rise and it's all around us and it's going to become more and more difficult for us to live we, I don't think we'll be able to, you know, how quickly this will happen, I don't know. But I don't think we'll be able to live. Uh, there's coming a day um, that we will not be able to live as we live now. Uh, and that's, I mean, nobody wants to hear that. Nobody wants to, none of us want to, we all hope that that's not true. Uh, I do. I hope it's not true. Uh but, you know, I mean, I was just talking to Doug this morning right before the service. I didn't know this. And in terms of YouTube, that if... <laughs> YouTube... Oh, okay. I think so, Henry. We love YouTube. We're living in those days now. Where it'll go, who knows? 
But we've got to learn to live as Daniel did in Babylon. And there's a lot, uh, I've got like 10 principles there that we'll share, when, you know, when, probably after the first of the year. But whenever that is, uh, we'll, we'll do that. Uh, so Babylon is here. And we must come out. And, and, and so there's a lot more that, that was spoken. It was a powerful weekend, a powerful conference. Uh, and, you know, but I do believe God really, he sealed a lot. And I want to just pray for that. And, I, and before we, uh, Doug, don't cut off the, the uh, video thing to, because I want to share a, a little promotion for the gospel. Okay, we'll pray at the end. Okay. All right. So before we uh, end the uh, online uh, thing, we do want to just encourage all those who are watching us online to participate with us in giving to the Life School Golf Tournament. It's our annual fundraiser uh, for our ministry in Africa. Uh, it's the, turn the golf tournament is October the 5th, but really want to encourage those who watch us online to, to contribute and I think uh, Ben's putting up the, uh, the thing online. You can go to give.lifeschoolinternational.org uh, and participate uh, in that. 100% uh, of that, other than the expenses of the golf tournament or whatever, go toward Africa, uh, we, where we are finishing this cycle of classes um, uh, of helping these uh, 2,800 pastors complete uh, the program, and most of them are in villages where they're very, very poor, and we give them material free, so you want to finish that. So anyway, we want just to challenge you to participate with us. If you've been blessed by uh, th these uh, messages and these teachings, we would really encourage you to help us so that we can get that uh, deposited uh, into Africa. So God bless you. We'll end the, the online uh, time at this point in time and I'll turn it back over to our pastor here the leader of the ministry yeah. thank you